times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going to heaven. We were all going straight the other way. And that's how Charles Dickens begins A Tale of Two Cities, which I think is one of the finest ways to begin a book in the English language. And it's a good descriptor of the way the world we live in, right? But then it's also a good descriptor for nearly every time in history, it seems like. But we really are kind of living in the best of times and the worst of times. I mean, we live in the best of times because we live in a time where technology surpasses everything else, every other technology that we know of. We live in a time where we have a medical system. Now, it might not be the perfect medical system, but it's a medical system nonetheless. We live in a time where in our homes we have things that kings would only dream of. We have refrigerators. We have dishwashers. No, I don't mean your wife. I mean a dishwasher. <laughs> Guys, don't think that. We have heating. We have air conditioning. We have running water and toilets. And never before have there been so many Christian books published, not to mention Christian media of all sorts, Never before has this been the case. And in your hands or in your pockets, most of you have a device where you can access more Scripture references, more Scripture resources than any other time in history. Leaders like Jerome, Erasmus, Calvin, and countless others would envy you what you have in the palm of your hand. But we don't always think of it that way. This is truly the best of times. But then again, we live in the worst of times because it's, this is a really weird election season. I don't know about you. I haven't lived through a lot of election seasons, but this is a weird one. We have assassin, assassination attempts. We live in the worst of times. Students take guns to school and kill their teachers or try to. We live in a time of conflict and war. We live in a time when legalized slavery is abolished, but the secret slave trade is still active and growing. We live in a time when countless millions of babies have been killed by their mothers and fathers. We live in a time when men can be women and women can be men, and on a whim they can change it back again. We live in a time when, with just a click, you can dive into the deepest and darkest things the human mind can produce. We live in a time when their terms disinformation and misinformation are used instead of you know, a mistake and a lie. We live in a time of social media, truly the worst of times. And I think if we took a poll here in our church that most of you would say we are living in a godless time, a time that is the worst of times. And that's probably why Pastor Troy is doing a series uh, about Elijah, um, God's man in a godless time. And these first few sermons are setting a stage for when Elijah comes. Because what's happening is it's building up to a godless time. And really the whole purpose, let's see if we did this right, of, oh, no. You want to go to the next slide for me? Oh, my, never mind. My slideshow's not up there. Good! I hate slideshows anyway. <clears throat> so you'll have to pay real close attention. The whole purpose of First and Second Kings is to show you the covenant failure of God's people, but at the same time, it's showing you God's faithfulness. We go from a time of covenant faithfulness, where they build a temple, to a time when they get exiled in Babylon. And throughout that whole period, God is faithful to his covenant. And in one sense, the book of Kings is kind of a microcosm of all of human history, because there's several indications that there was a covenant that existed with Adam. Adam. Hosea 6-7 says the people sinned like Adam and have transgressed against the covenant. And we live in a constant application of God's faithfulness to the covenant because we die. That is God being faithful to his covenant. But just like that covenant, the covenant that uh, we hear in Adam and the covenant we're dealing with in the kings, there's a glimmer of hope. God gives us an infusion of hope so that even when there's difficult times, there's particularly trying times in history still. We have something to cling to. And we're going through a time in our history where we're seeing 
faithlessness. And we will continue to see faithfulness or we might see revival. But through all that, we have to remember God's promises and God's plans are still at work. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And the text we're going to deal with is 1 Kings 14, so I'd encourage you to turn there. Basically, what we're going to cover are uh, three kings, and we're going to see a continued decline from Solomon through Rehoboam and his grandson Abijam. And then we're going to look at Asa, who is the first king whose heart turned back to the Lord. And who be- he tried to change the nation's faithlessness to faithfulness. But we're going to read 10 verses uh, at the beginning. 1 Kings 14. We're going to read 21 through 31. Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, became king in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which Yahweh had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah the Ammonitess. And Judah did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and they provoked him to jealousy more than all that their fathers had done, which the sins they had sinned. They also built for themselves high places and sacred pillars and ashram on every high hill and beneath every green tree. There were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which Yahweh dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Now it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came against Jerusalem. And he took the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the king's house. And he took everything. He even took all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Then King Rehoboam made shields of bronze in their place and commended them into the hand of the commanders of the guard who keep the door of the king's house. Now it happened as often as the king entered the house of Yahweh that the guards would carry them and would bring them back into the guard's room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all he did, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Now there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah the Ammonites, and Abijam his son became king in his place. Now if you remember, several weeks ago, Pastor Troy already talked about Rehoboam and his foolishness. And because of his foolishness, Israel rebelled, and you have the splitting of the kingdom into two. And we kind of detoured to talk about Jeroboam and the house of Israel. And now our attention is turning back to the kingdom of Judah and to Rehoboam. And just the first thing to note is how short Rehoboam's reign is. It's 17 years as opposed to the 40 years of his father Solomon. So it's shortened. But I find a more interesting statement is that the author says that Jerusalem was that the place where Yahweh had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. This says that Jerusalem was the place the Lord had chosen as a special place, the place where his presence would rest. And this is in accordance with what we find in Deuteronomy 12. We're going to do a lot of flipping today, so I hope you're ready. Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 9. Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 9. So Deuteronomy is the law given just as the people are about to enter the land. These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall be careful to do in the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. I mean, that wording sounds familiar, right? It's what we read in First Kings. And you shall tear down their altars and shall shatter their sacred pillars and burn their ashram with fire, and you shall cut the graven images of their gods in pieces, and destroy their name from that place. You shall not do thus towards Yahweh your God, but you shall seek at the place which Yahweh your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there, for his dwelling, and there you shall come. And there shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contributions of your hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, the firstborn of your herd and your flock. There also you and your household shall eat before Yahweh your God and be glad in all that you sent for, send forth your hand to do in which Yahweh your God has blessed you. You shall not do at all what we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For you have not as yet come to the resting place and the inheritance which Yahweh your God is giving you. Now I know that's a large section out of Deuteronomy. But the point is the Canaanites, they created all sorts of shrines and places to worship. They had a multiplicity of gods. They were polytheists. They had many gods. And part of the reason they had many gods was because they had many places of worship. 
There might, there, two cities might have the same God, Baal, for instance. But if they have Baal in Jericho and Baal in Ai, they will have different traditions, different expectations. So you end up with basically two different gods. And the law of the Lord in Deuteronomy says, you shall not do thus towards Yahweh your God. They were not to make a bunch of different locations to create multiple versions of Yahweh. They were to have one place where the teaching of the one God would be a single truth. That's what he's talking about here. You don't get to create God in your own image. You don't get to create your own way of worshiping him. You don't get to create your own truth. One truth, one God. That's why there's one place. And this is not just a matter of worship. We kind of think of religion and in life as two different sec- two different boxes you can put things in. This is not a difference like we might sing one kind of song here and another kind of singing at another church. That's not what he's talking about. This was the truth about God and the truth about life. So when we read in 1 Kings 14.21 that Rehoboam was ruling in the place of Yahweh's name, this is telling us that he was ruling in the place where the truth of the Lord resided. This is where people were supposed to go. In Isaiah 2.3, it's expressed really well. It says, From Zion... Another name for Jerusalem. The law will go forth and the word of Yahweh for Jerusalem. To rule in Zion was to rule in the location that was to be a light, not just for Israel, but a light for the nations around the world. It was a privilege to rule there. This was the place for truth. And what do we find there? Look at verse 21. It tells us that Rehoboam's mother was Nema, the Ammonitess. And as you read through Kings, you'll notice that the kings of Judah have their, you know who their dad is. But they also list their mom's name. And this might be a way of legitimizing the passing from one king to another. But this queen mother, she had some influence in the kingdom. Jeremiah thirteen eighteen gives us a picture of a queen mother having a crown and a high seat. So if this was the case, and I think it is for some, then the mother of the king had influence. And this is certainly true of Rehoboam's mother, because notice what she is. She's an Ammonitess. Israel was forbidden to marry into the nations of the land. And this was because the Lord said they would turn their sons from following the ways of the Lord. And they would turn their hearts to other gods. Now how would marrying a woman from another culture do this? Think about Proverbs 31. Has anybody, has anybody read Proverbs 31 recently? Who's talking in Proverbs 31? Or who's he talking about? Or who gives him the advice? Do you remember? What? Yeah. His mother. In Proverbs 31, the mother teaches his son, her son. The king's mother instructs the king. So is it likely that Nehemiah did not instruct Rehoboam? I don't think so. So unless Nehemiah joined in the covenant and devoted herself to the God of Israel then what would have influenced her teaching? Her own background, her own culture, and her own gods. This is just a fact. We all know it. Parents influence their children, and through that influence, they influence other people. Now, I don't think Nama was sitting in her tower, you know, like one of those Disney evil queens, rubbing her hands together, mirror, mirror on the wall, how can I make Israel fall? No, I don't think that's, that's pretty good, right? No, I don't think that's what was going on. I don't think that's what was going on. She was probably doing what she thought was best. And in her culture, in order to make the universe work, you had to worship the gods. And so what did she teach her son? You have to worship the gods. And so my point isn't to pick on Nema, but to show that by making the choice to marry foreign women, Solomon influenced his son away from God. This doesn't diminish Rehoboam's responsibility, but it does give us an indication of why he went into unfaithfulness. And it should make us stop and wonder, how are my choices affecting my family? Did Solomon marry Nema for political reasons? Was it for love? It might have been for love. Whatever the case, his choice introduced unfaithfulness into his family. How often does this happen to us? How often do we invite something into our homes because of love, 
because of entertainment, because of enjoyment, whatever it is, how often do we invite these things in without realizing they bring unfaithfulness? And unfaithfulness isn't just what you believe. It's the life one lives, the worldview one has. It affects absolutely everything, and it affects other people as well. One of the arguments presented in Kings is that the king influences the people. A faithful king will lead the people in faithful conduct, whereas the unfaithful king will lead the people in unfaithful conduct. And I don't know, in my mind, there's a temptation at least to say, well, the king's to blame. The king's to blame. Uh, we, should blame, we should blame Solomon, and that's why Rehoboam sinned. We can blame Solomon, Rehoboam, and that's why the people sinned. But the author of Kings corrects that thinking. Look at 1 Kings 14.22. After describing Rehoboam's heritage, the author says that Judah did evil in the sight of Yahweh, and they provoked him to jealousy. Now this is different than what we find in the later on in the book. Like, we'll read about Abijam, Rehoboam's son, and he's the one who walked in the sins of his father. Or later, King Jehoram, who is said to have done evil on the side of Yahweh. But the point being made right here is that Judah as a whole did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so this raises a question in my mind. Who led whom? Did Rehoboam give Judah the idea? Or did the people act in spite of their king, doing whatever they desired? And he was too weak or uncaring to stop them. I mean, this might, we might ask a similar question. Uh, does our nation act wickedly because we have evil leaders? Or do our wicked leaders simply reflect who we are? How about in a local church? Does the local church grow unfaithful because of wicked leaders? Or do they have wicked leaders because they are unfaithful? Who's to blame? The fact here, the author says it was Judah who did evil in the sight of the Lord, indicates that the responsibility did not just rest with the king. God certainly did and continues to judge the hearts of leaders, but this is not divorced from the people as a whole. Because think about it, what had happened when Rehoboam was first crowned king? He was a harsh taskmaster, right? And what did the people do? They rebelled. They tore away from him. So right here, when he starts leading the people astray, what could they have done? Stopped him. Rebelled. But they didn't. The people had agency to act, but they just chose evil instead. The people were as much to blame. And as we look at our own times, can we only blame our leaders? We like to think so, but will God only, blame our, will God only judge our leaders? See, this is one of the difficult things about examining this passage because it's not just about individuals. In our, in our circles of church, we like to think of individuals, and cer individuals are certainly important, but it's not just about individuals. There's a sense in which nations are being judged here. Now, Israel and Judah had a special place. They had entered into a covenant with the Lord, and the Lord was holding them accountable this whole time. And He brought curses on them, and by bringing the curses, He was being faithful. And because they had entered into covenant, it's logical to say, well, the United States isn't in covenant with the Lord, so we can't draw an application. I think that's fair. But at the same time, we can't ignore the reality that the Lord did and does judge nations outside of Israel. Look at 1 Kings 14.24. Look at what it says. If I can find it. Look at what it says, Sam. There, uh, so they did according to all the abominations of the nations, which Yahweh dispossessed before the Israel. Why did the Lord dispossess those people? Because they had abominations. Deuteronomy 9.4 says this, Do not say in your heart when Yahweh your God has driven them, those nations, out from before you, saying, Because of my righteousness Yahweh has brought me into possession of the land, but it's because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is dispossessing them before you. God does judge the nations of the world. And he does so in history. And by this I mean God is not just enacting a final judgment. He is pouring out his wrath now and blessing nations now before that final judgment. And another part of this is that because Jesus is risen from the dead and has sat down at the right hand of power, 
all the nations have been given to him. Now, already, Psalm 110 speaks of Yahweh saying to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. Jesus is right now sitting at the right hand of God and his enemies are being put under his feet. Psalm 2 speaks of the nations raging and seeking to tear off the cords and fetters of Yahweh and his anointed. And a warning is given to the nations and the judges. They say, serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest you become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may be soon kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. So the point of this is that Judah did evil. And we must recognize that nations can do evil. And nations can reap the consequences. Uh, jump down. Look at 1 Kings 14, 25 through 28. We'll come back to the verses before that in a minute. But this is an instance where the author is kind of subtle. He tells, uh, he tells us the specifics of what Judah did. And then he says, Now it happened in the fifth year of Rehob, King Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He doesn't say because Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. Then the Lord said Shishak. But I think the implication is there. And 2 Chronicles 12.2 actually does make it explicit and says, Now it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam because they had been unfaithful to Yahweh that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Political and military problems arose because of unfaithfulness and sin, and this affected the nation. Now there are some Christians who think that they refuse to see God working in these kind of calamities. I was at a church once where the preacher was adamant that God does not bring harm, pain, and suffering. If trouble comes, it may be the result of sin, kind of as a natural consequence to actions. But to this pastor, God is not the cause of trouble and harm. Now, I agree with the idea that there are natural consequences to our sins. And those result in harm and trouble. But at the same time, the biblical revelation is that God does bring calamity. The coming of the Egyptians against Judah is a clear example of this. Calamity coming upon Judah is not just the logical consequence for their actions. It is God at work. Troubles are not simply naturalistic outcomes of faithlessness. They are covenant consequences. It is the Lord God being faithful to His covenant that these things happen. To some people, this like you might be, yeah, that's true. But for other people, it's almost blasphemous to say God is responsible for these things. Because we think that goodness with God is only about me being happy or pleasure happening to me. But in reality, good is often unpleasant. Working out is unpleasant. Running is unpleasant. That's why we shouldn't do it, right? The discipline of God is for our good, but it's not fun. And really, this is not foreign to the way our nation has thought in the past. If you think about the Civil War, now I know there's different opinions of why it was caused and the righteousness of either side, but there was one man whose heart changed and he had a different perspective of the Civil War from when it started and from when you know, it ended. And that's Abraham Lincoln. There was a change that occurred to him between his first inaugural address and his second. Now, Abra I don't think Abraham Lincoln believed in Christ. I don't think he did. I see no evidence of that. But... He still made an observation, and he still believed in some form of God. He noticed that the North and South prayed to the same God. They read the same Bible. They were both convinced that they were righteous in their cause. Lincoln thought about, well, if this was just a political thing, it should have been solved by now. If this was just a military problem, the war should be over by now. And he wrestled with, why is it not over? Why is the turmoil continuing? And so he searched his soul. He searched the soul of, his, of the nation. And this is what he concluded. This is from a second inaugural. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs that be that offenses come, but woe to that man by which the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that all American slavery is one of those offenses, which in the providence of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove. And then he gives to both north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those 
by whom the offense come, came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in the living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Do we believe that today? Do we believe that the judgments of the Lord God are true and active today? Is the living God alive today? Again, the coming of Shishak in 1 Kings was punishment upon covenant Judah. But God is still at work. We should be mindful that what happens to us as a people might not always be because of sin, but it should cause us to pause and reflect. As Christians in particular, we need to be mindful and make an honest assessment of our lives. At the same time, we should make an honest assessment of our culture and see if we love those around us. Because if we love those around us, we will be willing to speak prophetically, meaning pointing them to the law of God, calling people to repentance, to the ways of God. Any self-reflection, though, whether of individuals or of nations, must be accurate and true. And it has to be specific. And this is what we find in 1 Kings 14, 23-24. There are several things listed which provoke the Lord. The people of this period of time were worse than any who had come before them. And considering what had taken place, you know, this is, this is probably referring back to the book of Judges. There are some crazy things that happened in the book of Judges. Really crazy things. And see what... Israel, Judah did to provoke the Lord. They built high places. These are man-made installations that could be built up or torn down. This is where the religious acts would take place. They're not necessarily on hills. They might be in cities. And they were common in Canaan. Uh, there would be multiple high places dedicated to the Lord, which again would lead to multiple lords. Uh, the creation of these high places was at once pagan and polytheistic, but it was also going against God's command to have one place of worship. And by doing this, they were not lording over the Lord. They would become enslaved to idolatry and the follies of their own imaginations. So that's what they did. The next thing is they built sacred pillars. Now these are stone pillars, like you might imagine. They probably had images of cultic practices on them. They also built Asherim. Uh, some of your other translations might say an Asherah pole or a wooden image. And these were like poles, but they probably were shaped like trees in some respect. And they were associated with the goddess Asherah. And it's possible that these were objects associated with fertility cults where sex and religion were joined together. And both the Asherah pole and the sacred pillar were forbidden in Deuteronomy 16.21, which... It's kind of weird to me that God would even have to say this, but apparently it was part of their culture. He says, you shall not plant for yourselves an Asherah of any kind of tree beside the altar of Yahweh your God, which you shall make for yourselves. You shall not set up for yourselves a sacred pillar which Yahweh your God hates. Like, God hates these things. And the last thing we're told is that male cult prostitutes were in the land. And these might have been linked with the Asherah and the, the word in, might indicate male and female prostitutes. We're not exactly sure, but um, prostitution of this kind was forbidden in Deuteronomy 23.17. And these kind of people were equated to dogs and harlots. They were abominations to the Lord and were part of the reason he drove the Canaanites out of the land. And what's fascinating to me as I was reading through this is it's parallels what we find in Romans 1, 22 through 27. There's a spiral of degradation where they reject the true God and they end up in homosexuality and doing things to their body that they shouldn't do. These are the things that make for godless times. And it used to be in our culture, like we would try to rack our brains to find something that equates to idolatry and false gods, you know, worshiping the TV or the computer or work or whatever that is. But like in our culture, things have so changed 
that the ancient gods are coming back. I've heard that in prisons they worship Thor and Odin. They make these sacrifices to them. The Satanists, they laugh it up when they put an image of Pan in our state capital. And recently, the third, do you guys know what the third largest statue in the United States is now? A 90-foot statue of the Hindu god Hanuman, and that's in Texas. In our nation, there are the false gods coming again. And in our nation, there are people who worship at the foot of the ashram, claiming the right to whatever physical pleasure they want and whatever lust they want. And as Christians, we celebrate the overturn of Roe versus Wade, but we still find millions of children created in the worship of lust and pleasure who are then sacrificed in the deathly arms of Moloch. That's what abortion is. That's the sacrament of at least one party in our nation. How did we get here? We got here the same way as Judah. The people wanted it. And the leaders represented this will. But it's interesting. There's still an echo of truth. We're told in 1 Kings 14.25 that after Shishak took the treasures of the house of Yahweh, what did Rehoboam do? He built bronze shields to replace the gold ones his father had made. And we're told that as often as the king entered the house of Yahweh, that the guards would carry them and would bring them back to the guard's house. Rehoboam still acknowledged the true God in some respects, even going into his temple. And in the same way, we find the name of Christ or of God spoken by those who cherish the sacrament of abortion and we find prayers offered by those who refuse to acknowledge that there's only one true God. Like We still have these echoes of truth. Just like in 1 Kings. Now, after Rehoboam dies, the failures of Judah continue. Flip over to 1 Kings 15. We're going to read 1 through 8. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Absalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he committed before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to Yahweh his God, like the heart of his father David. But for David's sake, Yahweh his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the sight of Yahweh and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Now there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. And Abijam slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son became king in his place. Now, what's really interesting is another name for Abijam is Abijah, which means Yahweh is my father. So it shows us that even though Rehoboam and Abijam did evil in the sight of the Lord, still there was a tie to the true God. And Abijam's mother was Makkah, the daughter of Absalom. And your footnotes in your Bibles might tell you that this is another spelling of Absalom. So Makkah was the daughter of Absalom, son of King David. But Abijam did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not act like David. Why did Abijam do what was evil? Well, I mean, obviously there's none righteous, no, not one. But again, what did Rehoboam, his father, do? He did evil. And so Abijam's just walking in his footsteps. Abijam did not devote himself to God as David had done. And the fruit of that unfaithfulness was throughout Abijam's reign. He had war the whole time. But within this setting of tension and conflict, there's a light that shines through. God remembered his promise to David. For we read, But for David's sake, Yahweh his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and establish Jerusalem. Now this is referring to a promise that God made back in 2 Samuel 7. And if I didn't say it before, First and Second Kings just continue the story of First and Second Samuel. To continue all the way through. Flip over to 2 Samuel 7. This is one of the, the important covenants made in the Bible. 2 Samuel 7. If we start at verse 8. 
So David wants to build a temple for God. But he's not going to get to do it. And this is what the Lord says to David. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I myself took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you for wherever you have gone and cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place and not be disturbed again. And the unrighteous will not afflict them anymore as formerly. Even from the day when I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Yahweh also declares to you that Yahweh will make a house for you. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up one of your seed after you, who will come forth from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be as a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will reprove him with the rod of men and the strikes from the sons of men. My loving kindness shall not be removed from him, as I remove from Saul, whom I remove from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So there are three things I want you to draw your attention to here. He says he's going to make David's name great. And think about history. One of the kings you naturally think of is King David. He's a great man in history. A place would, a place would be appointed for Israel. They would be planted there and have rest. And the third thing, a seed will come from David and the kingdom of that seed will be established and the throne of that kingdom will be established forever. Now that's important, but it's also important how David interpreted this. Look at 2 Samuel, uh, the same chapter, but look at verses 18 and 19. So David gets this great promise. Then David the king went in and sat before Yahweh, and he said, Who am I, O Lord Yahweh? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord Yahweh, for you have spoken also of the house of your slave concerning the distant future. And this is the law of man, O Lord Yahweh. And some of you might have a different translation there at the end of verse 19. Mine says, And this is the law of man, O Yahweh. And apparently this is a different phrase to translate. Yours might make it a question. Um, if you're interested in the discussion, I have a footnote in here that talks about it. But I think G David is making an exclamation. He's making a statement of fact. He's saying that the promise God had given him wasn't just for him, wasn't just for Israel, but was for all mankind. So when we're reading in 1 Kings of God leaving a lamp for David, it is a reference to this promise. Slowly, over time, God was bringing about this promise and his plan, even though Israel and Judah were being unfaithful. And we get to cling to the same promise. We look back at the coming of great King Jesus, who is the seed of David, and we get to know that he's ruling right now. The promise of God is engaged. It is active. We are waiting for its fullness, but we are not waiting for it to come. So cling to this, even when it seems like the godlessness is winning. Cling to the truth that the promise is winning. The promise is engaged. And there's a second truth we can draw from this. Because in 1 Kings 15, it makes a statement, this great statement about David, but then he recognizes that David did what wasn't right in the sight of Yahweh when it came to Bathsheba and Uriah. And this tells us something very important. In the assessment made by the author of Kings, who is inspired by the Holy Spirit, we see that God knows our imperfections. He knows we do evil, and yet the trajectory of our lives can still be more in line with God's will than not. There are consequences for our sin, but if we truly strive after God, then he recognizes that. He's not hard-hearted. We have hope that in spite of all our failures, imperfections, and the dark things we've done, because how dark, you can't get much darker than adultery and murder, right? You can't get much darker than that. We still have hope that God will redeem our lives and will still cause our lives to, in the end, be good for him and have hearts that are devoted for him. And this is how we should look at history, too. Abijam did evil, 
And the author of Kings is always looking back at David. David's kind of the ideal. Like we might look back at the time before the 1960s or before the World Wars or to the Puritan times. We look back on those times, but no matter where you look, human history has imperfections. And some of them are very dark in the people that we like the most. This must be recognized if we're going to do justice to our time and to the past. Now, after Abijam, he only reigned three years. Then Asa became king. So let's read about Asa. Or Asa, however you say it. So in 1 Kings 15, we're just going to read uh, 9 through 15. Now in the 20th year of Jer- Jeroboam, the king of Israel, Asa became began to reign as king of Judah. And he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Maka, the daughter of Absalom. And Asa did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, like David his father. He also put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols which his fathers had made. He also removed Maka, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made a horrid image of the Asherah. And Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it at the brook of Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to Yahweh all his days. And he brought into the house of Yahweh the holy things of his father, and his own holy things, silver and golden utensils. Now we're told that Asa's mother's name was Maka, and that was the same name as his dad's mom. But that doesn't mean they were brothers. The term mother here probably represents the queen mother, the dowager, which is the fancy word you should all use once this week, dowager. She held power in the land. Uh, She was influential, or so it appears. And she might have been the primary reason that the Asherah worship came to Jerusalem, to Judah, or she popularized it. But Asa was not like his father. He did the things that are right, and they're specific. He put away the male cult prostitutes from the land. He removed the idols that his fathers had made. He removed Maka, either his mom or his grandma from being queen mother, and he cut down the horrid image of the Asherah and burned it. And several of these things are like a one-to-one removal of the things that happened during Rehoboam's reign. The only thing he didn't do was remove the high places. We're not told why. Maybe it's because some of them were devoted to the true God. but That still breaks the law of God. But consider what he'd done. This was a man whose heart was devoted to the Lord, He demonstrated it by going against the traditions of his family. Look at verse 12. Asa removed the idols which his fathers had made. This was not just a fit of rebellion against his dad. This was repentance of all his family's deeds. To turn your back on family traditions and practice and beliefs, that ain't easy even if you're the king, and especially if you're the king, because if you do that, you're not just changing your family's traditions, you're changing the culture's traditions. Judah, if they were entrenched in idolatrous practices, would have been uncomfortable with the changes Asa had made. It would have changed their routines, their community life. Asa was removing from their culture the opportunities for these particular sins. So there's three important ideas I want to draw out of this description of Asa. The first has to do with the life of repentance. We think of repentance as a perpetual state of feeling sorry. But repentance is more than a feeling. It's a constant choice to turn from evil no matter where it is. For Asa, the evil was something that was deeply entrenched in his family. He had to take steps that probably made his family angry. I don't want to be flippant or make light of how important family is, but do you love God more than your family tradition? Repentance is an active thing, and it can result in the people you care about turning their backs on you, or you turning their backs on them. Yes, Asa was the king, but that doesn't make it any easier. Still, he devoted his heart to the Lord. And the second point I want to make is he was not just a pious individual. He was not just the king and in his own life dealing with sins. He was the king enacting public policies. Consider what he did. This was not just private repentance. He was removing sinful opportunities from the nation. Yes, this was a nation that was in a covenant relationship with the Lord, 
But think about Romans 13 for a second. God has given us stewardship to governing authorities for what purpose? To encourage the good and to punish the evil. Now this might look a little different for each culture, but ultimately the law of God is the standard of good. And if a nation is going to repent, then it would be of value for leaders to enact policies to remove wickedness, no matter the shape. This is not the end-all and be-all of solutions, because unless the people's hearts change, the nation will not change. But still, God has the power, and He's given the power, to governing authorities to do good and to punish evil. So we should pray that God would cause our governing authorities to do good and punish evil. Finally, why was Asa different than his father? Rehoboam's apostasy was influenced by Solomon's choices. Abijam's apostasy was influenced by his dad's choices. Why was Asa not the same? This is the great hope for all of us. The hope that God moves in the hearts of people regardless of their background. That is always our hope. That is always what we cling to. God is in the business of renewing the minds of individuals. And we should pray that God renews the minds of individuals and individual rulers as well. But hold that hope because God is in the business of doing that. Sometimes we get trapped into thinking that individual people are locked into the way they are. And sometimes this is true because sin enslaves you. Sin kills you. And without intervention, people cannot throw off sin. Yet God, through Christ Jesus and His Holy Spirit, is in the business of changing hearts. I've seen it happen. And after you see it once, it's hard not to say, God is going to do it again and again and again. God is going to do this. It might not be exactly how we want or when we want, but He shows grace to many, many people. And this is one of the central ideas I want to leave you with today. God is always at work. He is not always at work losing. He is at work winning. Even when there were kings like Rehoboam and Abijam who didn't follow his ways, he was still at work drawing his plan to a climax with Jesus Christ. King of kings, Lord of lords, died, risen again, and seated at the right hand of power. It is written of this Jesus. Having disarmed all rulers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, having triumphed over them. Every time we read of a lamp being left for David, it is because God had a plan which is working out, and this is our hope now. The writer of Kings probably considered the reigns of Rehoboam and Abijam as really the start of the worst of times in Israel and Judah. Even the reign of Asa was marked by conflict and the removal of treasures from the house of the Lord. And we too might live in our own worst times. And it's tempting to think that the end of the world is right around the corner. And I don't want to get into an eschatological debate with you, as much fun as that would be. But I want to challenge you. And here's my challenge. What is your hope? Is your hope that you will not have to face difficult times? Or is your hope God is in the business of winning over the enemy in time and in space. Is your hope to be one of the lucky few who escape? Or is your hope that the promise to David will be the law for all men in real time? We've seen in 1 Kings that the markers of unfaithfulness and wicked, of what the markers of unfaithfulness and wickedness are. We've also seen that the solution is true repentance. And so, Pray for repentance. Pray that God would work in the hearts and minds of our leaders. And pray that he will work in the lives of your neighbors and in you. Pray and live. Pray and live in accordance with God's ways so that you will be found blameless. Live in accordance with God's ways so that you can show how much better it is to live in God's ways. Show that following the true God is better than following the pagan gods of old better than following the God of my own will. As we approach the election, our hope is not in who is elected. Our hope is that God will not fail in his promise. Our hope is that Jesus Christ, the King of kings, 
who has been given all nations, will not lose a nation that is his. For he is the king of them all. May that be our prayer, that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.